Um, you know, it's a, it's a rainy, cold day in Berlin. I didn't think I'd be here giving this talk today, but I'm really excited to to see you all. Um, you know, I have I have a whole slide deck, but I really feel like the VIEW community is a place where I learned about applied open source, if, if that makes sense. I mean, I've sort of been doing open source for decades and having a community of people pulling on the same threads, knitting the same sweaters uh, is, is just a, a pleasure. So I'm going to uh, switch over to my deck. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about Towery, which is actually something that came out of my experience in the, the VIEW community. And um, what we like to do at the beginning of these talks is talk about who we are. Um, I'm Daniel or Daniel, depending on uh, which regional dialect of German you're using. I'm the co-founder of Towery. I'm the chairperson of the Towery Board of Directors, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about our um, organizational structure later. I'm working for the uh, European Commission's NGI, Next Generation Internet, uh, and helping people find funding for their open source projects. Uh, I'm also the CEO of a company called Crab Nebula that really exists as an extension of the Towery community. And, you know, as a, a member of the community, I've, I did the math recently. I've done over 20,000 hours uh, as a volunteer in my life. I think that a lot of it has been in open source, but a lot of it has also been in, you know, real world things. Um, and like I mentioned at the very beginning, I started really getting deeper and deeper into open source over at the Quasar framework. Um, so some of you might know that one. And if you start looking into Tower, you might also see some, some inspirations that we took from Rasvan back then. So what is Towery? Towery is a framework that helps you make a GUI hybrid app for any desktop and almost any mobile device. Um, by almost any, you know, there's there's um, different kinds of uh, mobiles out there, but we focus on Android and iOS these days. I know I'm talking to a JavaScript community, but I come from this community and I can tell you that learning Rust is something that has impacted the way I write JavaScript and TypeScript today. I think that um, it's easy to learn Towery because you don't have to know any Rust because we expose a very generous API that lets you interact with almost anything. I mean, basically, if you have a spa, you have a Towery app already. And as you have more and more needs for system features, you can add those in and uh, nine times out of 10, you can call them straight from JavaScript. We've built Towery to be secure by design, which means we've followed best practices such as not only tree shaking to remove the things that you don't want, but we, uh, we enforce a policy where you have to declare what it is you want to use from the feature set of Towery. And um, we do that with a, a, a minimal JS API that lets you send messages, and I'll, I'll show this again later, uh, let, it lets you send messages to the core of a Towery app that's written in Rust for you. Um, and when you want to display your app, uh, we offer three or four ways to do that. One of them is the web view. You know web views. Um, they're different on each platform. Uh, you have uh, web view 2 for Windows. You have WK web view. Uh, for Mac OS and iOS, and you have uh, WebKit GTK on Linux. But you can also use more advanced techniques, like you can take the eGUI library if you want that um, fast rendering. You can also use a WGPU and a direct shader. The binaries are really small. Um, if you're building a desktop app, uh, the binary shakes out at about, these days, 2.5 megabytes, uh, sometimes. Uh, less than one megabyte if you really gulf the, the, the binary. And what you probably know about JavaScript is that even with web workers, sometimes things just take a long time. 
And the power of Rust really lets you offload heavy computation to the entire power that the device offers you. You have all the threads. Um, and generally, things are just faster in Rust than in JavaScript or WASM. Um, you know, something uh, that Kent mentioned just now in his uh, response about thinking about the end user, thinking about someone in India, or in my case, someone who's traveling, you often end up in a situation where you don't have great internet. Um, on, on my phone, I'm roaming, and when I'm roaming, it won't automatically download all of the updates that I get every day. LinkedIn is what, 150 megabytes? It, it seems like it's not a big deal if you never leave the place where you're at, but I think that what we've learned from our community is that there are so many different network topologies and people out there with different kinds of devices that, well, the model that Electron gave us of shipping an entire browser inside every single app is um, not a great security model, but it's also all of this extra weight that we don't need. And I guess the point is when you try to develop something for everybody in this model, you end up shipping so much useless code, right? If your app doesn't need to talk to the internet because you're building something local first, then why are you shipping code that lets people talk to the internet, right? But with, with this, this um, monolithic single purpose, any purpose uh, software design paradigm that we've been living in for the past couple decades, it feels like we're just wasting code, we're wasting time, and we're wasting energy. And so by reducing the size of your apps that you're shipping to people's devices, you're reducing the attack surface, you're reducing the bundle size, and you're actually also saving a lot of energy. Um, it, it does ramp up. So Tauri is a community of, uh, I, I think it's well over 15,000 people right now, um, like you, who help us understand what we didn't do right. I, I, I'm not going to say that we don't like issues. We like finding out what we didn't explain well enough in the docs. And we like watching people grow into better developers. Um, we also have a volunteer working group, which is kind of easy to join. Basically, you just say, hey, I've made a couple contributions. And then you can become part of the, uh, part of the program. Now, in order to sustain uh, the moral stewardship of an open source project, you got a couple things to consider. First of all, rug pulls. So Tauri is dual licensed MIT Apache 2. However, the ownership of the licenses, the copyright, and the trademark are held by the Tauri program within the Commons Conservancy, which is a Dutch foundation. The important part about this is if the directors of the, the board uh, start doing weird stuff that people don't like, the people can remove the board, they can uh, elect a new board and make sure the board does the things that they want. And the board is elected by the working group. Now, that solves the, the rug pulling issue. Um, the other issue is, is maintainer burnout and keeping people excited by it. So uh, Lucas and I, uh, the co-founders of Towery, we started a company that sustains Towery to a great extent. Uh, we pay engineers in our team to help out at the help desk, to create new features. Uh, in fact, uh, we pay the security team that does the, the audits, the internal audits of Towery. So I, I think this, this kind of three-pronged uh, triumvirate is really important. Volunteers, a foundation, and a business partner. You know. There are cases where you're building a proprietary project, you need help, you need someone to sign an NDA, and the foundation isn't gonna do that, and the volunteers aren't gonna do that, so you have to have a, a company. Um, and then there are a lot of contributors who pop by, have a problem, get it sorted out, make a pull request, and get on with stuff, and that's also a really important part of every community. And then, you know, there's also uh, the Rust language community and many other upstream communities like Vite, just to name one of the big ones that's top of mind for me. Um, what is what are the the components of Tauri? And I'll show a diagram again uh, in a moment. Uh, we have a Rust core. Uh, we use uh, Winit or Tau to um, 
create a window or to uh, prepare things like key bindings and menus. Um, then we inject something into that window, uh, which is usually a web view, but it could also be another type of windowing renderer. Then we have Muda, which creates the, the menus for, you know, um, menus, taskbars, that kind of thing. Um, we use the system web view, like I mentioned earlier, depending on the platform, there's one generally accepted general purpose web view that we use. However, we are actively not only contributing to Servo, but we are creating a new web view uh, using the Servo engine that, you know, in three, four or five months will be early, uh, ready for early, uh, early adopters to, to check out and give feedback on. And then there's a plugin architecture. Like I mentioned before, you have to opt in by selecting certain plugins. You have to add those plugins and then you get the functionality that your, your application needs. And finally, if you decide to build an app or you're making software, you need to be able to ship an update. And so we've created a, an updater inspired by the Electron updater, but arguably more secure. And it's part of the, the core offering. Um, here is a little drawing that sort of explains in a picture what I was just talking about. So at the very top, uh, you'll see the Tauri icon, and that's what we make with Rust. That's kind of like the, the binary itself, the application. So you open up that application, and that starts the Tauri one runtime, and it initializes the window. It puts something into the window. Uh, it does all of this through whatever it is that the operating system offers or you've handcrafted and delivered. And then uh, you have a window um, passing... Uh, communication events and uh, between uh, the various components is uh, what we take care of under the hood and you really don't have to worry about it. Now, I talked uh, earlier a, a good deal about um, being able to ship anywhere. And I, I think it's important to mention that the biggest innovation of Tauri 2.0 is now you can build for mobile and, you know, we have escape hatches so you can write straight Kotlin or Swift, but you can also use the plugins that we've built or that other people in the community are building and contributing and putting that content, uh, making that, that the, the, those tools available so that you can call them straight from JavaScript, right? That's kind of the goal here. We want to make, Tauri more accessible to people who are amazing JavaScript engineers or even beginners in JavaScript who might be afraid of the, the Rust programming language. The point is you don't need to do any, any Rust really, um, but you can, and someday you should. So security is a really important thing. I think the difference between a, you know, a spa and a, and a website and placing a spa inside of the context of a Tauri app is that XSS or any other kind of vulnerabilities that could arise through a, um, a vulnerability in, in your stack somewhere, even if it's a supply chain attack or and people make mistakes too, I've, I've done them. Um, in an application that can have really you know, big effects. Maybe in the browser, most of them are, you know, they might just do something to data. But in an app, the, the context is you could have a vulnerability and someone could theoretically get access to the file system, the user's personal data, uh, which is a huge risk, which is why we've always built from the security first perspective where we have a policy that states minor releases, you know, the 1.1, when we update to 1.2, we have our security team audit it and audit, audit all of the pull requests to make sure that it's safe. Uh, based on what we know. And we also file um, CVEs or uh, GHSAs, uh, for those of you on GitHub, um, that disclose to the community vulnerabilities that we have found and fixed. And um, that's good for minor releases. However, a major release brings new functionality in. So uh, for the 2.0 release, we received funding from NLNet and NGI to get a full third-party security audits uh, taken care of by Radically Open Security. And um, we, we have to do this because otherwise we're putting something out there that's unsafe that we don't even want to use ourselves. 
So we do want to use it. And um, we recognize that there are always shortcomings and we have a, a full uh, disclosure policy. Uh, if you find an issue, just a heads up, uh, send an email to security at Um uh, Even if you're not sure if it's a vulnerability, because I think that the important and salient point to remember is that security is something we all have to be concerned about. And even a full professional third-party security audit might not surface everything that there is to discover. So you might find something and uh, please let us know through the appropriate channels. Um, like I mentioned before, these are the the platforms we can build for. So down to 10.13 on Mac OS, uh, Windows 7, 8, um, Linux with a large number of variants, iOS, Android. We do have people working on uh, Vision Pro and on Xbox, but they're super experimental. I don't expect to see much happening there for the next couple months. Um, we've got a lot of stars. You could go to uh, github.com slash towery dash app slash towery and give us another star. That'd be cool. Uh, but stars are, are just a, a popularity contest. I think that seeing the health of an organization is really good. You know, there's issues that are being filed and closed and pull requests and things are getting merged and there's a lot of activity. And that is a signal of, from my perspective of a healthy community. Um, there are other projects out there. Towery is definitely not the only one. Um, this is again, another, you know, stargazing uh, reference, but you know, um, Flutter just lost its team over at Google. Um, and I think, I think back, this is where it gets a little philosophical. Um, I think back a lot to the the week before we launched the 1.0 and the 1.0 for Towery was uh, a big milestone for us, but it was also the week where Internet Explorer and Adam Shell both received deprecation notices. And I think the, the important thing to remember is an open source community is healthy as long as people are using it and developing for it and the license can't be rug pulled and there's these strong commitments from everybody involved. So um, you get a great benefit of building on Towery because of the fact that we are using Rust and we have a strong audit posture. Um, a lot of the vulnerabilities in, you know, um, C++ code, which is kind of what a lot of browser tech projects are based on. Um, the, the, a whole class of vulnerabilities just don't exist. So when you do decide to try out Towery, um, you're going to have a lot of uh, benefit that we've baked in there for you, even if you're just using JavaScript. Um, there's a lot of companies out there building on it. There's a, more than will fit on this one slide, but these are all uh, close friends and, um, and allies in finding out how far you can really push things. So I, I highly recommend uh, checking any of them out. Um, I'll skip the Q&A because we're kind of running out of time. And let's just go for a demo, okay? So I'm going to ask to uh, switch to the um, screen share. Thank you. So, all right. Um, a Towery app has basically um, a couple components. There's a bit of Rust code, you know? Um, I'll see if I can just share this with you a little bit. Um, when you change Rust, you have to recompile. And recompiling takes a few seconds. However, I don't want to even touch the Rust today. I'm going to stick in our, uh, our view container. And I set up this uh, demo literally in three minutes. Um, I'm not going to set it up right now, but I will show you uh, the Android emulator running here. And I'm just going to change a couple things. Maybe I can move this over there. Um, welcome to view. You know, it's it's classic uh, HMR. You know, you know how this works. Um, and what might be interesting to look at is we're importing a function called greet 
And greet is, you know, your, your classic async function where we send a message using prepared Rust code on the other side that says, hey, when I get a message called greet and I get a value that, that's the name, I'm going to send a message back, right? So I'm just going to say my name, Daniel, greet. Hello, Daniel, you've been greeted from Rust. So Really quick, um, could you zoom in a little bit for us? Oh, sure, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, so what I was saying before um, is I send a, a message called a greet across the boundary from um, the JavaScript side to the Rust side. And then Rust sends this message back. Hello, Daniel, you've been greeted from Tauri. So um, if I go to the Rust code, hello, you've been greeted from Rust. And I mean, it's not that complicated. You don't have to use it. And um, the, the, the nice thing is that everything you know about the web, whether it's, uh, you know, CSPs or um, remote hydration or uh, SVGs, all of that still works inside of Tauri. So you get to leverage all of your knowledge and build really quick apps really small. Um, so I think maybe we switch back to my slides. Um, and, oh, sorry for the infinity mirror, thank you. <clears throat> so the, the slide deck worked. Um, I always have a slide in case the demo broke because the demo guys don't always love me. Um, and I wanted to just take a, a couple minutes um, and tell you, like, there's two ways to get help. Check out the Tauri Discord. Um, you can find us at, you know, at the, the website listed below. You'll find all of our, our socials. But you can always... Um, get help from the company that built Tauri. And we're always making products. We love to hear what people are doing. And we think that it's a, it's a great, uh, great opportunity for you in case you decide to turn your product idea into a company uh, because we can help you out with that. So, um, you know, I, I know that we're running all a little bit late. I'd like to leave some space for questions in case, uh, in case if you came up for the QA and I just want to say thank you. Um, happy to, to, to meet you all here and. We do listen. have questions. Great. So, yay. All right. Uh, Ooh, I like this one. I, I think you mentioned a little bit, but also, um, is a good one of what's the advantage of using Tori over uh, Electron or Capacitator? Okay, I will also add React Native to that one because I think those are probably the big three. So Electron is just for desktop. Um, Electron ships an entire Node.js runtime. It also ships an entire Chromium type app, which means the baseline binary size that you're gonna have is about 50 megabytes ish, maybe it's more, maybe it's less, depending on, you know, what version you're sending. Um, and with Electron and Tauri and, and Capacitor, you can um, use any framework that you want. You can use Vue.js, you can, you can use React, you can use um, SolidJS, whatever you want. The, these types of multi-purpose frameworks don't matter so much. I think the um, the difference between Tauri and Capacitor is more of being able to take your code and run it on the desktop and the mobile without needing to change it. We started with desktop, but we changed and brought in mobile because having all of these paradigms available is really helpful. Um, I think also what... <laughs> Capacitor grew out of Cordova, which grew out of PhoneGap, so it has a very long history. And I've had trouble finding the right plugin to speak the style of Capacitor. Like, I would have to go back and find unmaintained plugins. And um, I think that Tauri is a newer take on that. Um, React Native 
has a very interesting story. I think, I, I know we're not in a React room right now, but what React Native is doing is really exciting. Um, I think in some cases, having the backing of a major industrial player uh, like uh, Facebook does bring its benefits. And uh, I would argue that React Native's uh, corporate support expo is quite similar to the services that Towery is offering. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm showing this one because we did just answer it. Uh, we basically went over it of what oh, are the advantages I, to using Can, I, can, I, can, I, can I hold you to this one though? Because there are um, advantages to using Electron over Towery, right? Oh, so, okay. No, I'll, no I, 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 uh, I've grown past the my uh, smelly socks smell better than everybody else's at point. And Electron ships Chromium, which means the user experience that people have on Windows, Mac, and Linux are going to be virtually identical um, at the expense of binary size. Now... This is a comment that we hear a lot from developers who are connoisseurs of, of apps. And their argument there is, well, why would I ever want to have multiple um, versions of my app out there? And, and I guess the, 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 the great part about being a web designer is you never know what kind of device or browser your app is going to be running in if you're just building a web app. And so uh, while I see that as a, um, a challenge for Towery, we are also working on, like I mentioned in the talk, a, uh, a new web view that will unify that look across all of the, 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 the device targets. Great, thank you. Uh, what is Towery's biggest strengths for building applications that can be deployed as mobile apps compared to other frameworks with the same functionality? Kind of the same question, but I guess maybe I'll dig into the, to the functionality aspect. Um, I, I guess maybe if we look at, at Flutter and React Native and Native Script and Capacitor, if we just kind of like took that subset of, of the mobile experience, um, React Native and Flutter, I'm just going to discard, not because I don't like the technology. I think they're amazing projects. But they force you into a single paradigm of user interface construction, right? You have to know React, and it's not even really React. And like that, for me, means, well, I do personally prefer something a little more different. I'm not going to play favorites here. We, we, we have a policy. There is no blessing of any framework uh, when we're, we're giving official Towery talks. However, that kind of, if those two leave the table, uh, Flutter uh, and React Native, then you're left with, uh, I'm probably forgetting a few, but I guess cute, you could go down the, the rabbit hole and then you're stuck in C++ land with all of the, the vulnerabilities that come with that. And Capacitor, well, Capacitor is based on a very solid JavaScript ecosystem that is also not built on Rust. So I would say that the, the, the biggest strength you have is that we've put thousands of hours of work into building a Rust-based engine that gives you this kind of default safety um, that removes all these kinds of classes of attacks. Sure, there's other ones, but I would I would really place that at, at the huge advantage. And like I said, you don't need to write a line of Rust to get your app out the door. And I, I see that also as a big advantage. In, in a way, it's similar to how a lot of other JavaScript tooling at the, the composition level is being written in Rust, right? Uh, because it just gives you as an author this awesome power that then all derivatives also enjoy. Thank you. And I know we only have like five more minutes. So the next one is a two-parter of okay. when will Tori 2.0 be available? But there's a follow-up question on that one. Sure. Oh, okay, uh, so Towery 2.0 is available as a beta today. 
Um, I okay. just received notice before this call that the security audit work has been completed. We are yeah. merely waiting on the auditors to confirm three resolutions of their findings, which is something that I expect to happen this week. When that happens, when I receive the email from the auditors, then we mark Tauri as RC. And I don't want to tell you RC is only going to be two weeks. I don't want to say it's going to be four weeks. I think that is something that the community decides based on the mm -hmm. feedback we get. However, the API is not changing. It is stable to use. People are using it to put apps on the app stores today. Okay. And uh, it doesn't sound like you mentioned web as part of the Tori uh, part of where Tori deploy. How important is that going to be as part of Tori 2.0, the next version? You know, it's a really good question, um, and I'm going to answer it with uh, something we've learned along the way. Um, the Tauri team is a group of security hardliners. They expect everyone building an app to make it local first, lock down everything, perfect security policies. And so in the documentation for a long time, we said you can't build SSR apps with Tauri, right? Mm -hmm. Which is untrue. You can absolutely use a remote source for your web view and do SSR, SSG, and then pull that content into the web view and display it there. And the, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that for many use cases, having a web presence is important and having special features only available on the desktop are equally important. And I guess the, the, the way that Tauri apps are built the, the the actual succession is in a, uh, from a very like high perspective. You make a website, you build the assets that that website needs, you put those assets into a Tauri app container, and you sign that container and you ship it to your customers. And if you're running a website on Netlify or Vercel or, you know, DigitalOcean, you're going to have the same process. When you commit to Git and you um, merge to main, that might kick off a process that updates those current assets by building whatever you tell it to do, whether that's TSC or Vite build or whatever, and you're putting those assets on the web. And so because of the way you can detect if, what environment you're in, you can always ship a, an app to the web already. I think what I'm taking away from, from the question though, and it's something I'll, I'll bring back to our, to our community, is we maybe don't do a good enough job of explaining people that if they build for the web, they can also ship to the web. Great, thank you. And last question of, uh, what are the best practices for get, getting, eh? To get started learning Rust, there we go, as a beginner or somebody as an experienced programmer. I think the best way to get started learning Rust is threefold. One, uh, create Tauri app. Uh, PNPM, create Tauri app, dash, dash, beta. Um, will create an app for you, and then you have all of the structure already there as a good reference. The next thing you can do is check out a, uh, a GitHub project called Rustlings. Um, that is, is managed by the Rust Foundation. And Rustlings lets you run the Rust compiler. And the Rust compiler is this uh, friendly machine that tells you that you did something wrong until you fix what's wrong. And so the, the, the course is self-directed. Um, and I mean, for the first three or four exercises, you don't even need to, to reference the, the, the handbook, the, the manual, as it were, the documentation. Um, but as things get complicated, that's a, a great process. Once you've gotten that done, I think something that, that the Rust ecosystem does really, really well that I wished more um, language paradigms would use is slash examples. So if you go to any Rust repository, you have uh, root slash examples. And if it's constructed in the right way, you can actually run that example as it is, and it will show you some feature of the library or project that the uh, authors thought highlights or showcases what they're doing. So I think like just install the compiler, get Tauri running, 
and then do rustlings and then check out examples. Um, as an experienced programmer, as an experienced programmer, I think um, rustlings is actually a great way to learn about the differences and the, the, the typing. Um, the various types of strings that we have and why uh, the borrow checker does what it does. Um, yeah, so rustlings would be the answer for both of those. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Daniel. We greatly appreciate it. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you so much.